Assalamu alaikum, good afternoon, and a very warm welcome to the Emirates Airline Festival of Literature. Our guest today is a brilliant writer and thinker who provides a revolutionary new understanding of the human brain and its changeable nature. He believes that humanity's next, cha next chapter won't be defined by hardware or software, but rather by liveware, a super-powered, ever-changing machinery which all of us possess inside our skulls. David Eagleman is a neuroscientist and international best-selling author. He teaches brain plasticity at Stanford University, is the creator and host of the Emmy-nominated television series, The Brain, and is the CEO of Neosensory, a company that builds the next generation of neurotechnology. In our conversation today, we take a deep dive into the brain and all its fantastical qualities, from dreaming and memory making to the fabrication of reality and the mysteries of the consciousness. He writes in his opening pages, our machinery isn't fully programmed, but instead shapes itself by interacting with the world. As we grow, we constantly rewrite our brain circuitry to tackle challenges, leverage opportunities, and understand the social structures around us. At 4.45 today, when this session ends, our brains will not be the brains they were at four o'clock. Let's welcome our guests and embark upon a conversation about the recent thrilling developments in neuroscience and the exciting new frontiers of cognitive discovery. Please join me in welcoming David Eagleman. Thank you. I was just going to shake your hand. Hello. Okay. Thank you so much for, uh, for coming. This is such a lovely festival and a lovely city. And I have so many friends that I've been making over the years here. So it's great to see everybody. So uh, I'm going to talk about my book, Live Wired. That's what uh, we'll talk about today. Um, and I'm just going to speak for about 20 or 25 minutes. And then we're going to sit and talk. Um, and so what I want to do is just tell you a few principles from the book that have emerged about the brain. So um, who has ever seen a, a baby zebra get born or baby horse? Have you ever seen something like that? OK. So uh, what you probably noticed is in about 45 minutes, it gets up on its legs and it starts you know, wobbling around and starts running. And um, this is true of most animals. They start running pretty, pretty soon. Baby dolphins are actually born swimming. Who's ever seen a baby homo sapien get born? You probably know they don't walk around in 45 minutes. It takes a very long time. We have these incredibly extended childhoods, and that is because with humans, Mother Nature developed a great trick. She figured out that with humans, what she can do is push them into the world half-baked and let experience wire up the rest. And so what that means is, we, you know, we drop into the world with these very um, underdeveloped brains. And then from there, everything gets wired up from the moment in time that we drop into, in the neighborhood we drop into, the culture, the religion, who your friends are, who your parents are. All of that wires your brain. Now, the great advantage of this is that what we can do is springboard off the top of everything that has come before us to go into the next generation. So, you know, when you look at a, a crocodile or a horse or anything like that, um, they're doing the same thing that they've been doing for millions of years. They're born, they're essentially pre-programmed, they run their programs, eat, mate, swim, whatever, and then, uh, and then it's on to the next generation that does the same thing. But with humans, we get to um, take everything that's come before us and go from there, and that is why we are the species that has taken over the whole planet, and we have gotten off the planet and we make you know, symphonies and vaccines and we build cities like Dubai and we compose great music and so on, precisely because we have these brains that can absorb the world around them. So as was said in the introduction, you really can't think about the brain as hardware or as software. Instead, it's what I call liveware. You've got this giant forest of billions of brain cells that are constantly reconfiguring every moment of your life. And um, technically, this is called brain plasticity. The, uh, the term comes from uh, 100 years ago. The great psychologist William James was impressed with plastic manufacturing because he noticed that 
you know, the key thing about plastic is you mold it into a shape and it holds on to that shape. And, and that's what brains do, right? When you, you know, if I ask you the name of your fifth grade teacher, you might be able to remember that and that's because somehow your brain forest was shaped by that and it's held on to that all these years. Um, but I think we're well past the days of being impressed with plastic manufacturing because of the size of the issue that we're talking about. That's why I prefer the term liveware. Now the key is the human brain is really large, the largest in terms of our body size. You know, we have the same size brain as, let's say, a horse, but um, they've got a much bigger body that they have to take care of with their brain. We've got these small bodies in comparison to these huge brains. Um, and brains are the most complicated thing that we have ever found in our universe. So uh, a human brain, as I hinted at earlier, has you know, 86 billion neurons. Neurons are the specialized cell type in the brain. These are cells that are like other cells in your body, but they have these processes that connect with others. It's like a, a, a naked tree in winter. And um, each cell is talking to about 10,000 of its neighbors. But here's the key. Every single neuron in your head is as complicated as the city of Dubai. Every single neuron has the entire human genome in it. It's trafficking millions of proteins around in very complicated cascades. And, um, and because they're so densely connected to all their neighbors, with these connections called synapses, you've got hundreds of trillions of synapses, which is incredible. This means if you took just a cubic centimeter of the brain, there are more connections in there than there are stars in the Milky Way galaxy. So it's a very complicated system we're talking about, but somehow this is you, all of your hopes, your dreams, your aspirations, the agony, the ecstasy, it's all happening right there in, in, in this three pounds of tissue. Okay, so um, the key thing that I want to emphasize for this talk is this issue that who you are in particular comes about from the reconfiguration, the constant reconfiguration of this forest of neurons. All of your experiences, every conversation you've had, every relationship you've had, everything like that is stored in here, and this is what makes people so different from one another. Um, okay. And so I just want to give a few quick principles from the book, and then, and then we'll do um, a conversation. And then what I really want to do is have you guys navigate it with Q&A, so anything that anyone wants to talk about. But here's a few principles. Brains are very different than computers. Um, now I'll give just an example of that. This was a case some years ago, a 44-year-old man, normal IQ, was having some leg pain. He went to the doctor. The doctor couldn't figure out why he was having leg pain. He said, why don't you get a brain scan? We'll just see if there's anything there. So um, this is what a normal brain scan looks like. So this is just showing a slice down the middle of the head there. I hope you guys can see it from there. Anyway, ignore the numbers except for this number three. That's what's called the lateral ventricle. It's an empty area where you have fluid running through it. Um, so when this guy got his brain scan, his brain actually looked like this. And this is the lateral ventricle here. He had something called hydrocephalus, which means he had uh, too much pressure in that fluid, and that expanded the empty space there and squished his brain up against the side. But here's the thing. He was, you know, perfectly normal. He had a job. He was married. He had kids. Um, everything. You would never suspect that he was walking around with his brain squished up like this. But this illustrates how incredibly flexible the brain is compared to anything else. If you run over your laptop with your truck, it's not going to work anymore. And what, what this tells us is that liveware is a very different kind of thing. Um, and this is the same if, you know, if I were to take my, my cell phone and rip out half the circuitry, it would not work anymore. But incredibly, this can work with, with a brain. So, where I grew up, um, there was this uh, child named Matthew who started getting epileptic seizures. And these became more and more frequent to the point where he would have several per hour. And his parents were trying to figure out what they could do. Um, and they finally figured out what was going wrong is he had something called Rasmussen's encephalitis, which is an inflammatory problem that affects an entire half of the brain. And it turns out the only solution for Matthew was to get what's called a hemispherectomy, which means the removal of an entire half of the brain. 
So half the brain is taken out, and that's what shows up as, as black space here. Um, the incredible part is that you can do this, especially in a child, as long as they're under about eight years old, and the child is perfectly fine. They have a slight limp on the other side of their body, otherwise they're fine. Cognitively, they can do all the same math tests and vocabulary tests and do perfectly fine in school and in life without half of their brain. What I'm emphasizing here is how different this is from the stuff that we know how to make in Silicon Valley. All the computational stuff where if you damage some of that circuitry, it's not gonna work anymore. So we're dealing with a very special kind of thing here. So, so that was the first lesson I, I wanted to, um, to say. And then I had mentioned this before, that brains come to the table half-baked, for, for human brains in particular, and then they absorb the world around them. So I'll just give you an example of this. There were some experiments done in the 1960s in California where uh, a woman named Marion Diamond looked at, at the neurons, which are these, these processes here, um, she looked at these neurons with, uh, in rats that were raised in a normal environment or raised in a deprived environment. So, so some rats were taken and they were put in a cage all by themselves and they didn't have anything to play with. Um, and you can see there were physical differences to the naked eye with how their brain cells looked. And then she took other rats and she put them in the party cage with balls and wheels and other rats and their neurons looked like that. They made more connections across the brain. And so this is when people started figuring out that the experiences you have in the world actually get reflected in what is physically in your brain. And, and there have been many um, of nature's cruel experiments where you end up seeing children who are, who are severely neglected and you see the cognitive problems that came from that. One example is in the Romanian orphanages after the fall of Nicolae Ceausescu, um, there were tens of thousands of kids in these orphanages whose parents had been killed, and, uh, and there were too many kids. And what the staff realized is that if they paid attention to the children, the children would you know, cling to them and want to be with them. And so the staff decided, okay, we're not gonna talk to them, we're not gonna hug them, uh, we'll just you know, feed them. And it turns out that these children all grew up with severe cognitive deficits as a result because when Mother Nature drops a brain into the world, there's the, it's a gamble, it's the expectation that there will be love and speech and attention and touch and that sort of thing, and that's what you need to wire up a brain correctly. So early experience matters. Okay, I'm gonna move on quickly to the next thing, which is that incredibly, you know, the key is your brain is, is just this three pound organ that's locked inside of your skull, and it doesn't know what your body looks like, but it figures it out. And so um, uh, what was discovered actually also in the 1960s was that there is a map of the body inside the brain. The brain, f the, the brain knows what your body looks like. So when people discovered this, they thought, well, maybe that's you know, genetically predetermined where you have um, knowledge of what the body is. But it turns out it's not genetically predetermined. The reason we know this is because if you, for example, uh, you know, lose an arm in an accident, something terrible like that, your brain's map will readjust. Your brain always is making an active representation of the body as it has, as it can control it. And I'll just give you the summary of how it does this. It has to do with the amount of information coming in. So if there's a lot of information from different parts of the body, that all competes, but as soon as there's less information coming in, then that part of the territory gets taken over. So I'll do this by analogy. So if you look at North America in 1750, this was the territory that the French had, and this was the British territory. And what happened is the French just sent fewer ships. And so what happened is the British were able to take over the territory because there was more activity coming from England than there was from France. That's how they took it over. It's the same thing in the brain which is to say, uh, if somebody loses an arm, the territory that used to belong to the hand gets taken over by the neighboring territory because now the arm is not sending any more information. And you may already intuit this because of things like um, what happens in somebody who is blind. What happens is that 
things like, you know, the back of the brain that you see there, by the way, this is uh, an inflated version of the brain. It's just a way of showing the imaging where you can sort of clearly see what's happening in the, in the valleys. But anyway, this orange area is where you see activity for a blind person when there's sound or there's touch, but this is normally the visual system. But if you're blind, your visual system gets taken over because no territory lies around and goes unused in the brain. So if there's anything unused, it's a very fluid system and it takes over and starts using that. Now, um, and by the way, that's why blind people are actually better at you know, discriminating with touch or telling the difference between sounds. It's because they have more brain territory that they're devoting to that. Um, now, interestingly, uh, one of the very recent surprises in neuroscience is how fast this kind of thing can happen. So I, uh, was, I saw a paper from some colleagues of mine at Harvard um, where they did this experiment where they blindfolded people and they put them in the brain scanner and they uh, were looking at what happens when they expose them to sound or touch, things like that. And what they found was that you could see activity happening in the visual cortex within an hour. Within like 60 to 90 minutes, you could start seeing the visual cortex getting taken over by hearing and touch. And that was much faster than anybody had expected. And so that led me and a student of mine to a totally new hypothesis about why we dream at night. And it turns out the reason is because we live on a planet that rotates into darkness, and in the dark, you can still hear and touch and taste and smell, but you can't see anymore. And obviously I'm talking about evolutionary time when there was no light at nighttime. So when you rotate into the dark, that puts the visual system at a real disadvantage. And so our hypothesis was the way the visual system defends itself against takeover is by blasting random activity into the visual cortex every 90 minutes during the night. And if you look up the, the circuitry involved in dreaming, it is, it is random activity that just goes to the primary visual cortex and, and nowhere else in the brain. So every 90 minutes, you're just blasting activity in there. And our hypothesis is that this is, you know, dr because, because we're visual creatures, if you blast activity back there, you, you see, you think you're seeing and having full visual experience. And so that's the brain's way of preventing takeover from the other senses. In other words, uh, dreams are essentially a screensaver. You're just making sure the other senses don't take over. And so what we've done, by the way, is now done very detailed studies across 25 different species of primates, and these, you know, the different species have different amounts of plasticity, and what we found is that the, the amount of time that you dream every night is perfectly correlated with how plastic the brain is. So for Homo sapiens, which are very, you know, we have very fluid plastic brains, we spend a lot of our time dreaming. But for other creatures who are born more pre-programmed, they don't need as much dreaming to protect their visual cortex because their brain doesn't move around as much. Um, if anyone's interested, we've written scientific papers on this, but if anyone's interested, we summarize this in a, uh, in a Time Magazine article, which I would invite you to read. Okay, so, um, great. Now I'm moving rapidly on to the next principle, which is that the brain can wrap itself around new data streams. So, you know, you've got these eyeballs and these ears and, you know, fingertips and nose and mouth and stuff like that. But these are just ways of getting information into the brain, which lives in silence and darkness. And, of course, the eyes aren't piping in light and the ears aren't piping in sound. Everything is getting turned into spikes, these little electrical signals um, that zip around in the brain. So everything is the same. It's translated to a common currency in the brain, these electrical spikes and these uh, chemical results that happen uh, from those spikes. But I, I started hypothesizing a long time ago that the brain maybe doesn't know where information is coming from, and you could push information into the brain via unusual channels. So I ended up building a vest that had vibratory motors on it, and for people who are deaf, who can't hear, we capture the sound and turn the sound into patterns of vibration on the skin. So that's taking the sound information and pushing it into their, onto their skin, which goes up their spinal cord into their brain, 
And the question was, can people who are deaf learn how to hear this way? And the answer is yes. So I'll just give you a sense of what this looks like. Um, so I'm, I'm speaking here. Is there any audio? There's no audio here. Okay. That, okay, it doesn't matter. But imagine that I'm speaking, and, and there's this pattern of vibrations that's happening that is converting that sound into touch. And, and um, so just to give you a quick sense of that, here the woman is saying the word sound, and the, the motors are spread out from low to high frequency. Here she's saying the word touch. It's, you can see a different pattern there. And this is exactly what your inner ear is doing. Your inner ear is just capturing air compression waves of the eardrum and then breaking it up into frequencies from low to high and shipping that off to the brain. So. Um, this, without audio, I'll, I'll try to translate this. This is a student of mine, Scott. This is one of our, this is our first participant, actually. His name is Jonathan. He was born profoundly deaf. So Scott says a word. I think he says the word you here. And, and Jonathan, who is deaf, writes on the board what he understands from, the, from what Scott said. So here he says, uh, where. And Jonathan is able to translate this pattern of vibrations on his skin into an understanding of what's going on. And of course, it's, he's not really doing it consciously because it's too complicated, you know, this whole pattern of sounds, but nor are you doing it consciously. You're not saying, oh, Eagleman's saying some high frequency and then some low and some medium. You just feel like you're hearing my voice, even though, of course, my voice is taking place entirely inside your skull. You feel like it's taking place out here. Anyway. That's what's going on. He's able to translate what's going on with the pattern of vibrations on his skin into an understanding of the audio world. Um, we recently had National Geographic at my lab filming. This was a deaf participant, but they weren't there because of him. They were there because of his daughter, who was born deaf and blind. And um, so we built a little miniature vest for her. And here she is picking up on the auditory world uh, for the first time. It's opening a new, a new door for her, and here her grandmother is taking her around and putting her feet on things, saying, okay, this is soft, this is hard, this is cold, um, and here the, she's on one of those beds that goes down and up, so the grandmother's saying down, 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 up, 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 and that's how you learn, is by making correlations across the senses. So this is how, that's how that works. So what we did in the meantime since this is we have shrunk the vest down to down to a wristband, and the wristband picks up sound, turns into patterns of vibration on the skin, and, uh, and we're now on wrists all over the world. So this was our very first participant here. Uh, I'll just let, let him speak for a second here to give you a sense of what this is like to be able to pick up on sounds. He's wearing an early prototype of it here. And so, uh, he's the president of the San Francisco Deaf Association, and this is just his description of what it's like for him. So, <laughs> anyway, so um, th th these, we, we just made a word cloud out of things that participants were writing to us about the kinds of sounds that they were picking up on that they didn't even realize were sounds in the world or whatever. They were picking up on all these sorts of sounds. Um, and so, one of the reasons I'm really jazzed about this is because the only solution for somebody who is deaf currently is a cochlear implant, which is $100,000 and an invasive surgery. And with this technology, we can make it for well under $1,000, and, um, and it doesn't require any surgery. And so this, uh, I think, changes the game a lot, and we are in deaf schools all over the world um, for this purpose. So um, oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay, so, oh, and I'll just mention, we're doing some other things, for example, with balance. It turns out that as people get older, about 15% of the population loses the function of their vestibular system, which allows them to know when they're standing straight. And this is a real problem because people will then fall down, they'll break a hip, and everything goes downhill from there. You guys have probably seen this scenario a lot. Um, so it turns out it's very easy for us. We just built a little collar clip with a nine axis motion detector in it, and that talks to the wristband, and it tells you where you're tilting and by how much. And so that allows people to be able to, um, to essentially have a perfect young vestibular system that's telling them how they are balanced. Um, another thing we've done is for people with prosthetic legs, uh, you know, if they've lost a leg, 
Um, it's very difficult to learn how to walk with one of those because, of course, you can't feel it and you have to look to see where it is. What we did is we just hooked up pressure and angle sensors in the thing and then somebody can feel with the vest or the wristband what their prosthetic leg is doing and then uh, as a result, it's, you know, it's the same way that your leg would normally talk to your brain. It's just going through a slightly different channel and people can learn how to walk very quickly that way. Um, we've done many other projects that have to do with feeding in new kinds of information. So here, as an example, is a drone pilot, and he's feeling the pitch, yaw, roll, orientation, and heading of his drone on his skin. So as the drone is moving around, it's like he stretched his skin onto that thing. He is one with the drone, and that allows him to fly in the fog or the dark or things like that. Um, We've done experiments about direct perception of social media. So you can take any hashtag you want and scrape you know, thousands of these per second and do an automated sentiment analysis and just to understand, are people saying positive or neutral or negative things about this hashtag? And it allows you to be plugged into the you know, millions of people at, at, at the same time. Now, who would want to be plugged in social media? I don't know, but it's a very cool experience that's bigger than a human can normally have in terms of understanding what's happening in the world on the fly. Um, has anyone here watched Westworld? Is that a show that people watch here? Okay, love some. Uh, okay, so this is a great show, I think, but um, anyway, I was a advi scientific advisor for this show, and so I put my vest into the show, so now I call it Vest World, but anyway, the, uh, for those of you who saw it, um, you may know, you know, these robots go bad, and so these military contractors drop in, so if you see in the middle here, he's wearing the vest, and the idea here is that he can feel on the vest the location of the bad robots and uh, he can take care of them accordingly because he is feeling in three-dimensional space what's going on around him. Um, and there are several scenes like this, you know, unfortunately they feel one of the bad robots but they weren't expecting them there and they get killed, which all goes to show if AI goes bad, my vest isn't going to help anybody. But the, um, the cool part is this was a way for me to experiment with the ideas of what we could do with the vest, and then we've done this in real life. So here we brought in people who are blind, and they're feeling the location of everybody around them using LIDAR. And, uh, and on top of that, we added navigation. So this guy's never been here before, but we say, you know, go to this, type, this conference room, and so he's feeling, okay, go straight, okay, go right, go to the left. He's, he's pausing here because the conference room is at 45 degrees, but he just feels where to go, and he's able to to get there. But the key is he can feel, okay, there's somebody over there and they're getting closer and closer and closer and now they're moving around behind me, stuff like that. That's actually better than what a sighted person has. You don't know when people are moving around behind you. So this is one of the things we're working on. We have many, many projects we're, we're doing, just as an example with robotic surgery, being able to feel what's happening with the patient on your skin rather than you know, having to look at monitors all the time. Um, um, you know, essentially we've got, we're, the, the largest organ in your body is your skin, but in modern life we use it for hardly anything and there's so much data we can push through. Um, you know, feeling entire factories and what's going on with the machines and so on, being able to feel that on your body. Um, you know, odor detection, there are molecular, um, you know, uh, artificial molecular detectors that can pick up on things. So instead of walking around with a dog because you know, we've got these pitiful little noses as humans, you can actually use a machine to pick up on molecules and then you feel that and you essentially become like a dog that way. Um, so there are many, many experiments we're doing with that. Um, and maybe we'll, talk about, maybe we'll talk about that during the Q&A part. But okay, on to the next principle. Um, one thing that's interesting, I, I find fascinating is that the brain, locked in its silence and darkness, doesn't know what body you have. It just figures out how to operate it. And it does this because, you know, when you're a baby, you flail around and you figure out how you're actually using limbs and so on. But it doesn't matter what kind of body you have, your brain will figure out what to do with it. So, for example, you might imagine that a dog's brain is genetically pre-programmed to run a dog's body, but it's not. It can just figure out what's going on. So, uh, for example, there was a dog who was born without front legs, and so the dog just figures out how to walk bipedally like a human. And so, um, and why? It's because the dog needed to get to her mother and to food and drink and stuff like that, so she just figures out how to do it. It doesn't, I mean, Mother Nature is extraordinarily flexible this way, and I think this goes underappreciated. Um, 
how, how much the brain can adjust to say, all right, if I send out these signals, this works, and I'm able to get to my food, and if I send out these other signals, it doesn't work, and so on. So that's how this goes. And then, um, you know, the world's best archer, actually, is a guy without arms. Uh, he got interested in archery, figured out how to hook this up with his legs, and he's got the longest shot, accurate shot in the world uh, in archery. And, you know, in, in my television show, The Brain, I covered this woman named Jan, who uh, is paralyzed from the neck down. So she got these electrode uh, arrays implanted into her brain. So uh, these electrodes are listening to what her, what her brain is trying to operate. And then you can turn that into operating this robotic arm, this very supple, wonderful robotic arm. And so Jan can, can operate this just with her brain signals. Now, which might sound weird, but of course, remember, you're just operating your arm with your brain signals. You're sending them down. They go down your spinal cord into your arm, move the muscle, and that's how your arm moves around. So she's just learning how to do that, and she gets better and better at operating these, um, this kind of arm. So it's an extremely flexible system. And just uh, to wrap up some of these rapid points, I want to say all the stuff that we're learning about brain plasticity, I'm very enthused to see how we can build a new generation of technology. So in Silicon Valley, where I live, everything is still all about, hey, how do you build the most trim and efficient hardware and software that runs on that? And that's been a super successful endeavor for the planet. But I think the places we can go are so much beyond that. I'll just give you an example, which is, you know, the Mars rover Spirit um, cost billions of dollars. It went up. It did a great job. But eventually, it got its right front wheel stuck in the Martian soil, and it died there uh, because it couldn't get out. But if you contrast that with something like a wolf, uh, it gets its arm, you know, its, its leg trapped, and what does it do? It chews its leg off, and then it figures out how to walk on three legs. Was it programmed to walk on three legs? No, but it figures it out. Why? Because it cares. It has to get to food and back to its pack, and, and it has a yen for survival, and so it just figures it out. And, and if we could build our machines more like that, then Spirit could have just you know, sawed its uh, leg off and figured out how to move around in a way that it was not pre-programmed for, but just could do. So anyway, I think there's uh, enormous opportunity to, th to rethink machinery much more like the way Mother Nature does it. Um, and so I'll just mention one last thing, which is your brain comes to reflect what you do. And what's interesting about this is you know, we think about brain plasticity in children, and we think, wow, their brains are so plastic, they can learn a language just like that, and so on. Um, and we feel like adult brains aren't as plastic, but there's a reason for that. The job of your brain is to make an internal model of the world, is to figure out how the world operates out there. And uh, what happens as you, as you age, you're getting better and better at figuring out how the world works. So that's great news, you're trading off flexibility for expertise. You get really good at stuff, um, and so you simply don't need to change the brain as much. But the point that I want to make is, if you are motivated to make changes, it is just as flexible. You can still do things at any age. You can learn new things. There have been a number of studies about adults, let's say, picking up juggling for the first time or learning a new musical instrument, and you can see changes in their brain with brain imaging. With the naked eye, these changes can be so large that you can see those changes happening. So if you are motivated, you can make anything happen. Um, I'll just mention as one example, um, you can look at the brain of a, a violin player versus a pianist and see the differences physically. This is because um, a string player uses great detail with their left hand and with their right hand, they're essentially just bowing. But a pianist is using great detail in both hands. And as a result, the, the motor system, this is looking at the top of the brain, the part of the brain called the motor cortex changes on both hemispheres in a pianist, but only one uh, in a string player. And interestingly, um, when Albert Einstein died, people looked at his brain to try to figure out how can you figure out you know, what is genius in the brain. Well, we still haven't figured that out yet, but you could see that his brain looked like that on the top one. Why? Because he was a violinist. And so um, what you do changes your brain. Yeah, you know, there's this expression of you are what you eat, but you're also uh, you are what you put into your brain and what you choose to do with your time. Um, I'll just mention one more thing on that, which is that this is a slice of a healthy brain, what it looks like, but this is the slice of a brain 
with advanced Alzheimer's disease. And what we're used to, of course, is that somebody whose brain looks like that has cognitive deficits that we can pick up on easily. But it turns out um, there's been this ongoing study in America called the Religious Order Study, where they looked at nuns, Catholic nuns, and um, many thousands of them who all agreed when they die, they donate their brain for research. Well, what, what was discovered is that some fraction of these nuns, their brains looked like that. They had advanced Alzheimer's disease, but nobody knew it when they were alive. Nobody realized they had Alzheimer's. They were cognitively doing just fine. Why? It's because Till the day they died, they lived in these convents. And so they had other nuns they were arguing with and talking with. They played games. They had responsibilities and chores. They had to drive places. They were, do, they were living life and doing all these things. And as a result, even though their brain was physically degenerating with Alzheimer's, they were building new roadways all the time. And, and so nobody knew that they had that. Contrast this with what happens normally when people retire. Often their lives shrink and they don't have much of a social life anymore, and so they're not building new bridges and roadways, and when the tissue starts degenerating, it becomes obvious cognitively. So the thing to keep in mind, for any of you with parents or grandparents or whatever who are retiring, is just make sure you stay active because it is the best thing that you can do for your brain is to make sure that you are constantly challenging your brain. You have to do things that are at the level between frustrating but achievable um, in order to build those new roadways. And, and by the, people ask me all the time things like, well, what about Sudokus? And the answer is, Sudoku's fine until you get good at it, and then you gotta quit that and do something new that's challenging to you. So anyway, that's the key. I just wanna mention that on the way out here. So, um, okay, so seek novelty. You know, no, matter what, no matter what you're doing in your life, just make sure you keep pushing your brain to seek out new things, to build those new pathways all the time. Okay, I promised I would keep this short so that we could do the Q&A. So thank you very much, and we'll talk to you. David, thank you so much. What a brilliant, brilliant talk. Okay, we will open up for questions. There is so much in the book, Live Wide. Um, I think what I found when I, I read the book, it, certainly is accessible. I think you bring science and you show the benefits mm -hmm. that it can have. So, yes. you know, that whole sense of uh, doing something for a purpose, and, and that's totally changed for me. I want to have purpose in my life, mm -hmm. not so much because it's now going to make me happy, but it's good for my brain, yeah. right? <laughs> exactly so right. One, of the, one of my favorite parts of the books was when you talk about memory. Mm. And there's a, a particular chapter in there called Remember When, and you begin to um, paint this portrait of a, a dying grandmother. And that's not why it's my favorite, because it opens up with a dying grandmother, but her, her last memories are not her recent memories, they're memories from her childhood. And you talk about a, a similar experience that Einstein had when his last memories were when they took him back to his childhood language of German, when we don't know that. Why does the memory work that way? Yeah, so this is one of the oldest, this is, I think, the oldest rule in neurology is that older memories are more stable than newer memories. And nothing else works this way. Um, like, you know, any institution, um, it's the newer stuff that's remembered, not the old stuff. But in, in human brains, it goes the other way. And that's because memories become more stabilized with time, because essentially, you're writing down memories in the physical structure of the brain and things get deeper and deeper and can hold on to it. So yes, when Albert Einstein died, nobody knows his last words because he spoke in German. Even though he'd been speaking English for his entire adult life, um, he regressed to his childhood language. And this is what typically happens with people. They forget what they did this past week or this past month or year, but they remember their childhood quite clearly. So the enemy of memory is not time so much, it's other memories? Um, right, so it's, um, that's exactly right. That is what we find in, in artificial neural networks, is that if you put too much stuff in there for it to remember, it, uh, it starts competing and everything turns into memory mud. And so what's happening in the human brain is something quite different where the older stuff gets sort of down deeper and deeper and deeper to levels that, uh, it's like different levels of archiving. Yeah. So one of the other things that really interests me in the book was, um, you know, education and the, the brain 
of the, the digital native. And you talk a little bit about the gamification of education and how we can um, use adaptive software to that. So moving away from this notion of this teacher at the front, um, no engagement, no curiosity, uh, whereas we can use software now to adapt that. Can you sort of expand on that notion of you being a, a cyber optimist on the topic of education? And how can teachers and educators, and I'm sure there are some in the room uh, here, create a neuroscience compatible classroom? Put your hand up if you're a teacher or educator. Right, so there you go. Yeah. Right, Dubai, Great. the UAE, is, is definitely full of teachers. So we would really like to know how can we create that neuroscience compatible classroom? Yeah, I mean, so there's so many pieces of good news there. And one piece of good news is that this is, you know, there's a sense in which this is happening on its own, which is to say, you know, anyone with children who interacts with children know that so much of what kids learn, they discover online. Now, a lot of parents think, oh, online, that sounds bad. But in fact, you know, just the fact that we're able to carry around the entirety of humankind's knowledge in a rectangle in our pocket is such a stunning achievement, and it makes it so great for, for kids to be able to access anything. I mean, for those of us who are old enough, I'm probably much older than you are, but the, the, you know, even the evolution of dinnertime conversation, when I was a kid, we would argue about something, and then we got stuck, and someone would assert one thing, and someone would assert something else, and we didn't know what was right. But now, you know, everyone whips out their phone, and, da -da -da, and they know the answer, and the conversation moves rapidly to the next thing. And so, um, you know, all the time I'm talking to kids, you know, like a 12-year-old kid or something who says something really smart, and I say, wow, how did you know that? And they say, oh, I saw it on a TED Talk, because what, what children have now is this opportunity to hear, like, the world expert give the best talk of his or her life in 15 minutes, and when I was growing up, you know, we were just stuck with whoever our childhood homeroom teacher was, and that was the only person from whom we could get knowledge. So. I think we're guaranteed that the next generation will be smarter than we are. And just in general, because of the invention of the internet, what this means is that knowledge, as soon as it's discovered, disseminates everywhere instantly, which is incredible. And by the way, you know, education in every country has gone way up. Literacy has gone way up, such that illiteracy is actually you know, rare now, it's, it's the thing that's not standard, whereas it used to be for all of human history, the thing that was standard was that everyone was illiterate. So um, what this means is that the speed of innovation is going up exponentially, uh, which puts us in an absolutely wonderful situation. In fact, if you look at um, essentially how much humans have known over time, you know, we discovered agriculture and you know, written language before that, and things were very slow, and then suddenly stuff started going like this, and just within the last century, it's exploded yeah. with space travel and internet and molecular biology and so on. And on that, I think, sl slightly linked is, you know, I was really curious about, um, and I've seen it recently with, with my students, this notion of deep work versus distraction. You mentioned the phone there and whipping it out and getting this information. So, so what's your, your take on that? What's happening to the brain in that situation where there is a lot of distraction, where we're not able to focus on one thing? It, it, curious to get, get your take on that. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, look, um, I have this great quotation about how the next generation is, um, you know, they're, not, they're more distracted, and they're not picking up on things. This quotation was from a Roman statesman 2,300 years ago. And so every generation worries about this for the next generation. And in fact, in 1440, when the printing press was invented, people really had a conniption fit about that because they said, wow, kids aren't going to remember anything because they can just access it. You know, there's the answer on the bookshelf. And so when are kids going to memorize these epic poems and so on? But as it turns out, it's been nothing but useful for us so far. And um, so here's the thing. We, or I, I grew up, at least, in a world where, you know, you've got the one teacher droning on, and we had to really try to concentrate on that. Kids now are used to a different pace of information coming in. There's been this question about, okay, does everyone have ADHD? I don't think so. I think that's just, <laughs> we're in a world where you can get faster information and see a whole simulation of the solar system or what's happening in an atom or whatever. And so it's not so easy to just sit around and you know, read a boring book or something. So task switching and multitasking, 
where are you with that? Women or men? Can we do it or can we not? <laughs> Women are provably better at, at paying attention to multiple things, okay. especially after having children. Right. Um, and th I, this, this is a, a true thing. I mean, th there are these experiments that have been done in mice for many decades. But um, yeah, because women have to pay attention to several things at once, and men are um, more mono-minded and uh, for better or worse. So, so just a couple more uh, from me before, before we move, up, move on. You've talked quite a bit about senses uh, in, your, in your presentation there. Um, and members of the audience, if you haven't seen David's TED Talk from 2015, where you talk about the pH uh, model, uh, <laughs> pH being what, David? Being potato head model. So right. my, my, my description of what is going on in the brain is it's like a potato head where you just plug in any sensory device and it will figure out how to use it. And that's what we've been able to demonstrate with you know, technologies like this, is that anything you plug in, it'll just figure out what to do with it. So that's one of the ones yeah. you got yeah, on. Yeah, this is the, the wristband here. So you talk about senses quite a bit. And I just wanted to, to, to get your take um, on emotions and this notion that do we have these universal emotions, these common feelings of if you're feeling fear, is it the same fear that I'm feeling? If you're feeling love or joy, are they the same? What, what, what does neuroscience say about that? We suspect that they're very similar, but what's interesting is that your brain has come about not only from your genetics, but every experience you've had in your whole life. And mine has come about from my genetics experience and every single person here. What the end result is is that everybody's brain is somewhat different. And so if I say something like, you know, justice or freedom or you know fear or whatever we all assume we know what we mean by that but it's slightly different like you know how a pomegranate tastes to me versus to you it it can be different inside every head i was looking for an analogy uh for this some years ago and then i saw that matt damon poster for the movie the martian where he's all alone on the planet and i thought oh that's a pretty good analogy which is we're each the inhabitant of our own planet and, and we assume that everyone has the same experience as we do. Emotions can be measured physiologically, and there are a lot of similarities from person to person when there's fear or joy or things like that. But it's not exactly the same experience. Our interpretation of the world is, is a bit different from head to head. And so in the current climate, you know, there is a lot at the moment about division, about difference, about segregation, um, and we talk about human connection. We talk about us being social beings and loneliness being, being a, a killer. So how do you get human brains to think about commonality yeah. and not dif differences? Is there any way, David, that we can hack brains to not focus on differences? Can we almost um, engineer social media, you, you sort of brought it up there, to create algorithms of unity? Big question. Uh, yeah, uh, this is something I've worked on, actually. Um, so in my laboratory, we've done a lot of experiments about in-groups and out-groups and how easy it is for humans to fall into uh, in-groups. I'll just give you a one-second uh, example of what this is like. So imagine you go into a brain scanner and you see six hands on the screen. They all look about the same. And, uh, and the computer goes around, boop, 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 picks one of the hands, and then you see the hand get stabbed with a syringe needle. So feels awful to watch this hand get stabbed, and you have this network light up in your brain, which is the, the pain network, the pain matrix. And so it's not your hand that got stabbed, but just seeing it is enough to light this up, and this is the neural basis of empathy. We care about someone else's hand, even though it's not ours. Okay, but the main experiment was, I then labeled each hand with a one-word label. For example, Christian, Jewish, Muslim, Hindu, Scientologist, Atheist. And the computer goes around, picks a hand, you see that hand gets stabbed, and the question is, does your brain care as much if it's not your group, whatever your group is? And unfortunately, it turns out that way. Whatever your group is, you care a lot more when you see that hand get stabbed, and you don't care as much about the other hands. Um, and we did a, a number of experiments on this. It turns out, first of all, it's quite flexible. So in the next experiment, I say, okay, the year is 2025, and these three groups have teamed up against these three groups. And I take those six religions and I divide them at random. And now, when you see an ally get stabbed, your brain cares more than it did just a second ago. You care more, just predicated on one sentence saying that you're, they're now on your team, now suddenly you care about them more. Um, we also were able to show that this can be totally arbitrary. So I, 
I bring people into the lab and I say, okay, toss a coin. If it's heads, you're an Augustinian. If it's tails, you're a Justinian. So they toss the coin, I give them a bracelet that says Augustinian or Justinian. Then they go in the scanner and they see the same thing with hands getting stabbed, either labeled one or the other. And, and it turns out that you care more about your team, which is totally arbitrary, and you know it's arbitrary because you were the one who tossed the coin. And nonetheless, you care if you see a Justinian hand get stabbed versus an Augustinian. So um, humans are very um, prone to this sort of in-group, out-group thing. This is, by the way, not an indictment of religion because even the atheists cared more about atheist hands than they did about the others. So, um, this is just, so my answer to the social media part of the question is uh, I'm very interested in how to find the things that people have in common. So currently, the way this works is, you know, whatever things you're watching or posting, you see more and more of that. And this is part of what makes people into their own echo chambers. Um, but I'm interested in, let's say, there's somebody with whom you don't think you have much of anything in common, but what you see is that you both love a certain kind of dog. And so, you know, he posts something and you see, oh, and you like that. And he likes, uh, you know, kite surfing and you like that too and whatever. You find all these things that you have in common. What the algorithm does is it finds the things that bind people. And then later, when you find out that this person maybe has a different political opinion, you're willing to listen to him now. You're, you're willing to engage in dialogue rather than uh, put them in the out group. Thank you so much. Uh, David, as we look out, we have an amazing audience, and so let's open up for some questions. Um, if you just please state your name, pop your hand up, please state your name, and a nice crisp question, please, so that we can get through a number of questions. We can go over, I've been told, by about five minutes, so let's fire away. Uh, lady just there in the front, green top, thank you. Hi, um, my name's Emma. I've got two questions, I hope that's okay. My first question is, you were talking about uh, the fact that early memories stay, whereas later memories seem to disappear. Is there an evolutionary um, reason for that? Is, is the reason why, because the earlier memories are more important for survival? That's my first question. And my second question, you were talking about novelty. And then I was thinking, okay, so what can I do to stop, to, you know, City who isn't going to cut it. I'm going to have to do something else. So, so I need to read more books. And then I was thinking, well, if I read more books, the activity is the same. It's reading, but the, the subject matter could change. So does that count as novelty? Or is the activity, because it's the same, no, you've then got to come up with something else? Yeah, great question. The answer is you can have more novelty by doing even different things. So, um, I mean, reading books is great. It's one of the big ways we get a lot of our information. But... Um, you know, join a new club that you haven't been a part of, meet new people. It turns out the hardest thing that human brains do is other brains. And so if you can be around people doing stuff, that's an amazing way. Or maybe go to the theater instead of reading the next book or whatever it is to just change things up. That's the whole key. I mean, there are many, look, who's wearing a watch here? Who's wearing a watch on there? Okay, take your watch off and put it on the other hand. Um, go ahead and take it off and put it on your other hand because when you look at your watch, you're like an unconscious zombie, but if you switch to the other hand, it forces your brain off the path of least resistance and you have to do a little extra work. For those of you who are not wearing a watch, just brush your teeth with your other hand tonight. It's not that hard, um, but do it. Just get yourself off that path. Drive a different route home from work. There are a million things you can do just to switch things up all the time. Take the paintings on your wall and just swap them with each other, stuff like that. As far as your question about memory, um, I don't know if there's any evolutionary purpose to that, or it's just a function of the way the system is wired up. Um, but certainly early memories are what lay down the foundations of who you are. Like if you look at you know, the city of San Francisco 100 years ago, all the streets and stuff were there. Now it's a very different city, but the foundations are, are what? Thank you, great questions. We'll come to the lady there at the front, and then the lady that's just there in the second row. So a microphone over here, please. Sorry, making you run right you at the front. shout it out. Yeah, no, shout yeah. it out, and then I can repeat the question. Great. And, um, so I follow you as well as Dr. Robert Sapolsky, and I was wondering if you agreed with him that we don't have free will. Thanks. And the other, the other question I had was, you, had, you do some incredible work with physical um, disabilities. Have you had done something with mental health, with the brain right. and mental health? Yeah, Thank great you. questions. Um, I, I have been working on, on schizophrenia, and I have a, 
uh, a very new kind of theory about schizophrenia that's actually a disorder of time perception. And I'm probably not going to be able to go into that whole thing right now, except we've been able to demonstrate that people with schizophrenia have different time perception. I think that's a big part of what underlies a lot of the symptoms. Just as a one second example, you know, we're always talking to ourselves, you generate a voice and hear it, but if you were to get that timing just slightly wrong, you would have to attribute that to someone else's voice, um, auditory hallucinations, things like that. Anyway, um, free will. The question is about free will. Do we have it? We don't know. I think our science is too young to have any conclusion about that. Many neuroscientists, like Sapolsky, feel that we probably don't because the brain is essentially a big giant machine made of cells, and it's not clear where you get this extra free will in there. Um, on the other hand, it certainly feels like we have free will, um, but we just I would say we just don't know yet. Yeah, ask me again in 100 years. And hopefully we'll Thank have more. you so much. We're just going to go to the lady there in the second row, uh, second along, and then I'm going to go to the back because I've just put my glasses on, and there are some hands <laughs> off at the back. So Did just if we can limit it to one question, please. Nice, quick and I'll question. Try, and I'll try to be oh, Chris. Thank you. Hello. Uh, my name is Lyd Miller. Uh, I'm bilingual, and I have a question on bilingualism. So um, I, I'd like to know what's your understanding is bilingualism or multilingualism helpful and in which way in developing our circuitry and making it, keeping it lively, yeah. so to speak. Yeah, great. Thanks um, so much. The, the very brief answer to this is, uh, you know, it depends. If you, if you learn multiple languages at the same time as you're growing up, they both end up in the left hemisphere where language normally does. If you learn a second language later, it ends up in a different hemisphere. Um, and so different languages can end up different places in the brain. Um, but it appears to be, you know, a, a great thing for you in many ways. But one is that it actually expands the understanding a little bit of different cultures as you learn what the language, what the words are for that. This is something called the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, which is that the language that you speak actually shapes how you think. Um, you know, including languages that have like male and female nouns, things like that. The way that you're taught, oh, that's male, that's female, it changes the way that you think about things. So anyway, it's. Uh, all studies show that multilingualism is great for the brain. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Let's go to the back, please. So just, yep, lady just there with the black top, yeah, who's waving at me. Um, hi. I will just take a couple more questions, I think, because of time. Go ahead. Yeah, it's really cool to hear that you were a part of Westworld. And um, there are a lot of movies like that that feel like they've advanced science. Like, I don't know if you've heard of devs and ex machina. And yeah. so I'm just wondering, what, what do you think the role of sci-fi and um, the arts uh, is when it, as it relates to science and the exploration of it? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that question. Thank you. The class I'm teaching at Stanford right now, this quarter, is called um, The Brain and Literature. And essentially, one of the big themes is that we have a story shape hole in our brain. And so anytime you want to get something into someone's brain, you have to shape it as a story, and then it goes in. So for example, on the question of free will, you know, my colleagues and I have written papers about this forever, and nobody cares. But then with Westworld, they make the story about robots, about are they conscious, do they have free will? And suddenly, the whole world's talking about this question. Why? Because it was a great story, and, and it engages people. So I think that. Science fiction is a terrific way to deal with this. There's more and more connection between Hollywood and science now. And one of the things I did about a year and a half ago is I've started a production company to make film and television that have to do with science in a meaningful, realistic way, uh, precisely because I believe in this so much. So that makes sense, the link with literature, because your book, Livewide, is full of metaphors. The figurative language within there really makes it come alive. We're going to go to the back, but this this side, uh, gentleman over there. Um, thank you. Uh, fascinating and quite futuristic. Uh, one question I th thought of, maybe you're already looking into this. Um, is there a future of live Wi-Fi from live wired, like connecting minds, you know, people reading each other's mind? Is there anything like that that could be possible? Uh, it's such a great question. The answer is you can put electrodes into the brain uh, recently, uh, Neuralink, this company, got a lot of attention for that just in the past week or two. But, but people have actually been inserting electrodes in the brain for a few decades now. The answer is sort of. You, um, 
we have lots of stuff going on in our head and we squeeze it and squeeze it down to the thing that you're gonna say. But there's a very real sense in which we have evolved our societies to be able to understand you know, the words that you say and the words I say in return. If you could listen to my whole brain and I could listen to your whole brain, it's not clear any of that would make sense. Plus, I'd be thinking of 50 other things like, oh, my left toe hurts and I'm thirsty and blah, blah, blah. You know, while we're talking, all that stuff's going on in, in one's skull. So it's not clear to me that we're really going to take advantage of that in any meaningful way. That's what I think. Right, we'll just have one last question just over here. This lady here has had her hand up for a while. Pat and Top, there we go. And I'll stick around at the end, anyone who wants to ask Yeah, and there is some book signing, so David will be able to Great. answer your questions then very briefly. So just the last question. Uh, so have you got the mic? So if you go with your question, please. Uh, my name is Wed, and I wanted to ask about uh, the flaws in machinery. Uh, do you think by marrying uh, human brain organoids with AI or machinery, do you think that's possible? And if not, what do you think might happen? Great, yeah, super cool question. Um, maybe, and people, have, so if anyone who doesn't know, brain organoid is you can take brain cells and grow them and get them to sort of make a little three-dimensional ball where all the cells are talking to each other. So people are really interested in, in studying how neurons work when they're connected to other neurons. I don't necessarily think that's going to be the future, but instead, learning what neurons and brains are actually doing and using that to improve AI. So the AI we have right now is extraordinarily impressive, but it's using a cartoon version of the brain where it says, hey, let's just imagine there are units and connections between the units, and then we'll make a transformer model or a deep learning model. But we could actually make these artificial neural networks, which are already incredible, we can make them even more incredible by actually understanding the secrets of the brain and importing them over. David, that hour has absolutely flown past. I think we could have had two hours, so. Thank you guys for being here. In and your, I'll, I'll be here to answer questions, anyone who needs so to. So in your, in your book, just to wrap up, ladies and gentlemen, in your book, David, you write, because of live wiring, we are each a vessel of time and space. We drop into a particular spot in the world and vacuum in the details of that spot. We become, in essence, a recording device for a moment in the world. Thanks to live wiring, each of us is the world. Thank you so much for making this so meaningful. Thank you much so for being here in Dubai. We will have book signing. Now I do need to thank some people, otherwise I will get into trouble. Thank you so much <laughs> to the audience. Thank you so much to the AV team, the volunteers, the translators, our title sponsor, Emirates Airline, our founding partner, partner Dubai Culture, our parents' organization, Emirates Literature Foundation, and above all, all of that, please give a final thank you to David Eagleman. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you.